made the connection. So um, as I said in the email, you know, students worked up some questions for you. Um, I'm gonna ask um, Ayushi just to say a few words about you and maybe kick off the questioning, okay? Sounds good. Thanks for having hey, me. Hey, how are you? Hi. Good, how are you? Good. Um, so to everyone else, I met Zian in high school when he was president for Teens for Task, which was an organization of teenagers from different high schools dedicated to supporting and raising awareness for the Trenton area soup kitchen. Um, so Ziad, you've always been someone who I truly look up to, not only because of all your accomplishments, but also because of who you are and as a person and just everything that you stand for. So I appreciate that you are talking oh, to you. us today. Um, I am gonna start off with two questions. Um, the first one is just like, tell us more about your experience having dinner with President Obama. Um, I read a story that was like titled, um, that like related the fact that you were on the TSA watch list because someone, someone, someone who was on the watch list, like you shared the name, a name with someone yeah. on the watch list. And yeah. also the second question is tell us about some moments when you felt, when you felt inspired to become more involved in politics and activism and how you've dealt with people who've tried to shut you down. Yeah. So to answer the first question, um, if you told me that it never happened that I had dinner with President Obama, I believe you, right? It was like a truly surreal experience. Uh, and I started to redefine when I was in eighth grade and had no idea what the hell I was doing, right? But had a commitment to social justice and, and wanted to do something about it and got together with friends to, you know, galvanize and to organize around current events and stereotypes and identity and these things that we all care about as young people that we're all grappling with, that there's relatively little infrastructure to grapple with. Um, and so started it and it took off and resonated in a way I never could have imagined. And, you know, my sophomore year of high school, MTV News wrote a piece about me um, that was published in March of 2015 uh, that like, sort of changed my life overnight. And that piece was shared a lot, especially by the American Muslim community, Bangladeshi community, and I'm American Muslim Bangladeshi. Um, and that same day that the article was published, an, an, a White House staffer called me. Um, from the West Wing, who's Bangladeshi and Muslim American, who read the article and um, kept in touch with me and then ended up catered to President Obama at uh, age 16, which was pretty surreal, and having him speak about me in a speech and the work that I've been doing um, in terms of getting young people involved uh, and talking about current events and identity and stereotypes and, and creating a movement uh, as such. Um, and yeah, the piece, which is also by MTV News, interestingly by that same reporter, uh, I was very unhappy with. Um, uh, as basically what happened, long story short, um, is the piece itself I actually don't hate, but the title I hate uh, in that, right? Like I, I, I gave my interview and I was young and I was 16 and I didn't know that much about media. And uh, it was my, really my first foray those few months into talking to national media. And I try not to sensationalize my story. I don't think my story is that sensational. I don't think I'm that sensational. Um, and like I did my interview, like whatever, and then she emailed me afterwards. She's like, my editor wants to know a time that you've been discriminated against to help create the story. And like, I didn't think much of it. I was like, oh, weird, odd. And then I responded back in an email, some like list of things that like had happened to me, right? Like um, when I was a kid, uh, as a Muslim, I'd go to like the airport and you have to go to like a separate counter to get your ticket because our names are similar to names that are on watch lists. And so like, they are as extra security precautions. This happens to non-Muslim people too. This happens to anyone whose name is similar to somebody on a watch list. It disproportionately there's a lot more Muslim names, especially because Muslims tend also tend to have more similar names than like Muhammad's like the most common name right in the world. Ahmed, my last name is a super super common Muslim last name. Um, and I it was like that was one of the first times I remember being othered. Right, it's like knowing that they go earlier to the airport as like a four year old five year old kid because like there was just extra security precautions because my name was similar to people. Um, who might be on the watch list, and the headline reads, like, kid on TSA watch list, like, Ethan and President Obama, which is, like, a ridiculous, like, sensationalist portrayal of events that is, like, so far uh, from the reality. Um, and so that was definitely a learning experience of sort of how to engage with media and uh, to not always give media the story that they're looking for. And I think when you're young, and it's your first time, like you're really excited about the coverage. And now like I frequently turn down interviews, right? If I don't like the angle and, you know, and I will just, I, you don't, you never have to answer the question, right? You just answer the question that you want to be asked. And so I've learned the tricks and, you know, I um, know what I'm doing a lot better now, but that was definitely a learning experience. But to say the least, even to the President Obama and that whole experience was empowering and profound and 
it was I specifically a dinner with him at the White House of Star in 2015, um, which is a celebration of the American Muslim community. Um, and so to be around so many other American Muslims who are doing such incredible work and to feel so encouraged on my journey and to know that I wasn't alone and there's people who've been doing this work much longer and much better than I have um, and that they're willing to support me and to be there for me was really, really validating and a moment of validation that I'll hold with me for the rest of my life. Uh, and, and Obama is a, a really wonderful man interpersonally. Uh, so it was a good and enjoyable evening uh, on all accounts. Uh, and the press post was really good for the organization and good for me, but definitely a learning experience in terms of uh, how to engage with media sensitively and responsibly. Okay. Yeah, and then you're- I ask as I was listening to your answer, if you've become yeah. more media savvy over the years, and it sounds like you have, but you still see, I mean, this is a class where we look at the connection yeah. between media and democracy. Um, when you do interviews, do you see, still see an effort to sensationalize your story? Yes, I mean, absolutely. Um, absolutely, yes. I, on, my story has evolved and sort of what I'm known for and like a public light has changed over the years. So what the sensational aspect is has changed, but yes, definitely. Um, and I also study my research at Yale on social media's impact on progressivism, specifically in foreign policy. So I am very familiar with the academic discourse regarding um, media's influence on democracy and whether or not it's playing a progressive or regressive role and to what extent for the for profit model of journalism even is built to sustain truth and built to sustain progress and all of these questions that I know y'all are talking about in this class. And uh, where I land on the question personally is that I think to have responsible journalism, the entire journalism sector should be nonprofit. Uh, that is my personal belief. Uh, and um, yeah, but uh, a last, but usually second question was... Tell me oh. about the moments when you felt inspired to become more involved yes. in politics and how you yeah. dealt with people who shut you down. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's sort of two questions in there, but uh, I got inspired, I guess, to start in politics and that um, as an American Muslim, as somebody who cares a lot about the issues and was raised in a household or I wasn't asked, am I going to make a difference? Oh, no. uh, it was always just in, like intrinsic to who I was. Like my grandparents like watched the news like 24 seven and um, my other grandfather worked at the UN. And so I just grew up in a household where like talking about these issues and these politics um, was important. Um, and I was really privileged and lucky to be of a family and of a situation where I felt that I had agency to do anything about these things and that I did have agency to do about these, anything about these things, that I had a computer and that I had access to resources and all sorts of things like that was instrumental in my ability to activate. Um, and I don't want to diminish that in any way, shape or form. But I think a lot of people assume that I would have started Redify or started Jeep Consulting or started the things that I've started based on one singular moment in time. Um, no, that isn't the case. I think um, there were lots of moments, right? And I think to get back, and it's much easier to craft a media narrative if it, if it was one thing. Um, and if you look at many of my peers who are you know, youth activists or youth entrepreneurs, uh, most of their stories can be synthesized in a, se in a sentence. You know, like, they were homeless, now they're at X school, right? Like, it's how they're... There's no sensation. I, I have been very careful and also truthful in that there is no way to sensate, like to synthesize my story in that way. It's been much more comp. It, it, and their stories are also complicated, but there's not one like horrible thing that's happened to me. Um, I've been very lucky and privileged, um, and I'm not going to pretend that that's not the case. That is the case, right? Um, but moments where I learned a lot was when I went back to Bangladesh for the first time in second grade um, and saw real poverty for the first time with my own eyes when I switched schools in seventh grade from a all boys Catholic school to a co-ed secular school. And I grew up in a household of all girls because my parents were separated when I was young and come to, and I became to understand in seventh grade, the extent and entrenchment of gender norms for the first time. Um, as I was in a boys school, all things were boys things. I went, to, went at home, all things were girls things. And I didn't really like understand they were supposed to be so separate. Um, and so that was a big wake up call for me. And so those are the two moments I think in my, and the, and then also the presidential election, both in fourth grade and eighth grade. So like those four moments, I think, um, were like my political awakenings of sorts. Um, that sort of got me really thinking about the world. And um, I remember getting the time for kids in fourth grade and, you know, reading about like Cynthia McKinley and John McCain and Barack Obama and going home and, and, and begging my mom to take me to the local Princeton campaign office or Obama and plastering my backpack on Obama pins. And so like it was always something that like was really... Uh, intrinsic to who I was um, and grew, I guess, as I got older. Um, there are lots of moments where I think I looked around the world and wasn't happy with what I saw. And so I decided I wanted to do something about that. And so I tried to, and I'm still trying to. Uh, and how do I deal with people who don't get me down? I think it's just, I know my why, right? And my why is that 
I don't believe any group of people should ever be talked about without that group of people present and centered in the conversation, full stop, period, always. Um, that centers me. That's why I do the work that I do, whether it's Redefy or Drip Consulting or Progressive Advocacy or working on campaigns or whatever it is. Um, I believe the person closest to reality is the expert on that reality. I believe the world looks better when diverse young people have a seat at the table. I believe the world looks better when the rooms of decision makers look like the world around us. Um, and that keeps me going. I think that there's a lot of rational conclusions to looking at a world with so much entrenched injustice. Um, the conclusion that I make is, look, it is bad and it is ugly and it, there's a lot of evil out there, but there's also good. And to whatever extent possible, I'm going to wake up every day and try to make the world a little bit better. And I don't know if I always get it right, but I'm going to try and uh, it can be defeating and it can be disheartening, but um, I'd rather try than not. And so I do. Okay, great. You can actually have a good lead into what I think is the next question. Um, Ethan, um, I wanted you to ask your question because um, Ethan watched, um, I think, your TED Talk video and talked about the, um, you know, what it's like to sit across the table from someone who you know hates you or doesn't like you. Yeah. Okay. Ethan, are you there? Yeah. Um, I kind of paraphrased your question. You want to just, you know, say it again? Yeah. So, um, like Professor Lee was saying, um, I listened to your TEDx teen talk, um, and you're talking a lot about um, knowing of people who hated you and you'd sit across from them, um, and maybe they hated you for your politics or what yeah. they heard about you. Um, but you said how it's really hard to hate someone who you actually know. And who yeah. You with in person and I really agree with this and I've um, kind of come across this in my own small scale um, but I think this is why we've developed such a culture of like keyboard warriors and the people who can sit behind a screen yeah. and like um, talk so much hate and aggression towards people they don't know and yeah. so do you think that this is a large issue this keyboard warrior issue and what do you think that we can combat this this kind of idea of hating people who you don't really know just because it's easier to hate behind a screen yeah so I think it's a huge issue yeah for sure I mean I think that um, especially for women and plus-sized folks and um, people of color and disabled folks, like every time, or Muslims or whomever it is, every time you post something on social media, it feels like you're inviting hate um, and you receive hate. And, and, and the DMs that people get and the comments that people get are staggering and ugly and scary, really, really scary. And Pretty much every public person that I know who's like done anything remotely public has received death threats and rape threats, um, uh, and especially women, like I said, or, or get so much hate online. Um, so I think it's a massive, massive issue, um, and that people feel so empowered by the anonymity of the internet era that they're so brazen with threats that they don't mean, right? Like so many of these people, like if you get on the phone with them, they're like, I didn't mean it. Like it was just a joke. It doesn't sound like a joke when like you're like, brutally defining how you're going to hurt somebody, right? Um, I think the way that we combat it um, is one, uh, the social media companies need to take a lot more responsibility for the climate that they're creating. Uh, they have the power to have algorithms that screen out these accounts. They don't do it because when you screen out a lot of these accounts, you, act, you also screen out Republican lawmakers uh, and you also screen out other types of accounts, and I think they should all be screened out. If you are tweeting hateful things, then you shouldn't have an account, period. Um, and that would, and I think having algorithms that screen out hate speech um, will create a norm that you can't do that on that platform, right? And if you want to do that elsewhere and go on the gab, go off, right? Uh, but mainstream platforms should have stringent measures um, that screen hate speech. Because um, people are tweeting this shit publicly right, fully publicly, um, rape threats, death threats, hate speech. And um, so I think we need algorithms that screen that out and we have the sophisticated AI to do that and machine learning to do that. And so we should be doing it. I also think social norms need to change. I think that we need to have a culture of engaging with people we don't know, uh, of talking to folks, of having conversations with strangers, of talking to the person next to you in the subway, of getting to know more people and bursting out of our bubble and talking to people with different opinions than us. I think we need domestic exchange programs. Um, we talk a lot about foreign exchange and study abroad. I think we need to study domestically um, and learn from different realities and worlds. I think our media needs to do a much better job of telling stories that we don't know. I think that when you know somebody's story, that's a good proxy for knowing them. Um, and so I think we need to tell more stories and our media needs to be less polarized. Um, and I think we need to teach kids emotional intelligence and respect at a really early age. Um, algebra is not more important than respect. Um, and we know the most ridiculous things in our school system, but don't know how to talk to people. 
um, and don't know about stories. And I think that is such a failing of our academic system. I think kids in middle school are really mean and some kids grow up and learn to be a human and some kids don't. Um, and I think that's because we don't teach them. And I don't think that we can just expect parents who are educated in the same broken system to always know the skills and tools to teach people to be emotionally intelligent. And I think that we need that. And I think that most of these people who are these keep it warriors are being so cruel and being so mean because someone hurt them, right? And because they don't have people to go to because they're broken and they're hurting. And I think we need robust mental health services and we need a climate of a social media where the algorithm is fundamentally different that encourages discourse with people you disagree with and that you see everyone's content rather than just the 10 people who you engage with most, right? Um, and mental health resources, health, health resources in our schools, digitally, uh, et cetera, to have an ecosystem that allows for empowerment rather than disempowerment. Also, yeah, I think what you said about changing social norms is key because yeah, it would be great if like Facebook and Google and Twitter would self-police, but I think realistically, their companies, they're profit-driven. Um, I think it, it kind of has to be a movement, you know, from the yeah. public. Yeah. So, um, you talk, I mean, you're associated, you write, write a lot about, you know, Gen X, a couple of questions, students had questions about that. You know, Joe, you, you had a question about, um, you know, Ziad and, and his role with Gen X. You want to pose that one? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what kind of obstacles or really common misconceptions you face as such a polished active member of gen z yeah sorry i meant gen z there no no worries no worries um we have a lot of love for gen x or most of our parents are gen xers um uh so i think certainly lots of challenges and right lots of people have are skeptical right of like our company is all gen zers we're all young people and um definitely the beginning more skeptical skepticism than there is now um but I think there's lots of misconceptions around what Gen Z is capable of and, and who we are. And I think the challenges that I faced in the marketplace um, surround around people not believing in the power of our voice and don't believe like we're, we'll be powerful tomorrow, right? Like in, in the metaphorical tomorrow, right? Like Gen Z's time is later rather than now. And even when presented with data, people are like, no, like this isn't my primary consumer right now, right? Even though we're 46% of the US media audience, right? Given how much time we spend on social media, right? The average Gen Z are spending nine hours a day online, multitasking four out of those hours, right? And so we're, even if we're not your primary consumer, we're oftentimes your primary, con we're your primary digital consumer, right? And nothing is hot on social unless Gen Z believes it's hot, right? And middle school girls are the trends of every generation. They knew Justin Bieber musically were hot long before we did, right? And so driving that into my clients' heads into the business world's heads that Gen Z is powerful and hot right now and not like hypothetically in the future, um, I think has been my biggest challenge. It's not that they don't think we're smart, like they meet us and people are excited by us. And like, definitely like, yes, I am polished and I, I know what I'm doing, right? And so I've been around the block a few times and so people are like, okay, this kid knows what he's talking about, but do I need it, right, is the question. Um, and so I think that has been my challenge. Like people are intrigued. I can get meetings quite fairly easily, but um, getting pen to paper, right, is the challenge, right? And getting pen to paper is, is telling people that this is something that's worth investing in, right? It's worth long-term, sustainable, su sustained investing. Um, and that can be a challenge. I think we're getting better and better and better at it and, and we're growing. I mean, inshallah, God willing, the recession doesn't hurt us too much, but um, we'll see. Uh, the market's in a really interesting place right now. Obviously, a lot of people are hurting and suffering and we want to do our part. Um, to empower young people around us, but also to keep growing our business. Um, and so we're all walking fine lines right now, especially in terms of navigating conversations sensitively and responsibly, because um, we are a for-profit company, but we're a purpose-driven for-profit for company. And right, like I don't wake up every day super excited to make revenue. I wake up every day super excited to hopefully change the world. And so um, I try to convince my clients of doing that. And I think that's also a challenge is that like I wear my politics on my sleeve, right? And um, my purpose on my sleeve. I don't, I'd much rather lose a client for being who we are than ever gain a client by pretending to be something we're not. And I don't believe my client's always right. Um, uh, I believe in telling stories that matter and doing things that matter and that push society forward. And I don't want to take any projects that don't do those things that don't empower young people. Like we exist to empower young people. I audit every decision I make against that goal. And if something doesn't, then I don't want to do it. And so I think that's a challenge and not, um, in certain worlds, in certain ways, you'd be more successful if we were like, I'll take any business, you know, and I'll be palatable, but that's not me. That's not what I want to do. That's not what I'm interested in doing. So um, I think um, that's also, that's like both like a blessing and a curse, right? It's like being grounded in your values is, is why I think we're successful in so many ways, but also why maybe we're not. And I think also working with a bunch of young people is also a double-edged sword, right? Um, it's our value proposition, but also comes with obviously unique challenges. Okay.
Um, as I mentioned, like a lot of the students, not surprisingly, had questions about, you know, how'd you accomplish so much at this age? But um, Sarah, I wanted you to ask your second question, which was kind of along those lines, which is with all you've accomplished, why are you still in college? So is that, you know, you want to just add, I don't know if there's anything more to add to that, but I thought that was an interesting way to approach it. Yeah, I just wanted to know, like, with everything that you um, do and how successful you are, like, how do you handle being in school as well yeah. as everything else you have going on? Yeah. Well, we all go to Zoom University now, so it's very yeah. manageable. But um, prior to Zoom University, um, as you can see, I am brown. My name is Yana Med. My parents would not be very happy um, and have told me in very absolute terms that not going to school is not an option for me. And um, I care a lot about my parents and um, my family means a lot to me. And so their investment in me uh, matters. And so it matters a lot to them that I'm in school. And so it matters a lot to me that I'm in school. And it was like education is what I was raised with as like my most fundamental core belief. But even beyond that, like, yes, like Drew is doing pretty well. If I wanted to, like, I could, like, I'm at home in Princeton right now, but like I make income, like I could live on my own and like not go to school or depend on my parents um, if I wanted to, right? Um, but I don't. Like, I love my best friends at college and I love going to college. And um, I, I think I'm a better at my job because I go to college. Like we're talking about Gen Z culture and social media trends and trends and like I'm living it. I'm not just speculating about it, right? Like I go to school and I my whole Instagram feed is really until tomorrow posts that are ruining my entire life, right? Like that's like a real thing happening in real time. And because I go to college, like I'm seeing the trends that are happening right now. Um and I think that's important. Um, but I also just think that I don't know that I learned always so much necessarily in the classroom, but I learned so much from my peers. Right. And I learned so much from the conversations that I have with professors and people on campus. And um, I wouldn't trade that for the world. And I don't think that because one is successful, that means that they should stop learning. Um, yeah, I, I've been able to do some cool work and I'm proud of that. And I've been really lucky and privileged to do that. Um, but I don't want for my learning and my doing to be mutually exclusive. Um, and I feel really grateful that Yale is flexible enough that I can take once a week seminars. They, they just offer lots. I don't have like special accommodations. Yale just offers lots of once a week seminars. Um, so I just take once a week seminars at this point. And so I go to school two days a week and I'm in New York. I, I usually in, in New Haven, 12 days a month, New York, 10 days a month and traveling for clients and speaking like eight days a month is like my typical schedule. Um, so I'm usually three cities per week. Um, it's a lot to juggle certainly, but like the fact that I get to do it all is like really wonderful to me. And like, I wouldn't, trade one of these things for the other. Um, but I think school is not for everyone, but I think it should be for most people because I think um, if nothing else, the relationships you make with your peers uh, matter so much. Um, and just, it's like, it's a wild juxtaposition, right? To like go from meeting with CEOs at these like bougie resorts to like being in a dorm room, right? And like, I think that's an important experience for me to be having. Um, and, and I think college is a really equalizing force and just like being on the same page with so many of your peers at one time is really important. And so I, I love going to school. Like I genuinely love my learning. I love the classes I take. I love my friends. I, I love it. And so I keep on doing it. But there are moments when I'm like, I should just drop out. Like this is too much. But that's usually just during like finals period. But other than that, I'm chilling. I love that I get to do it all. Yeah, it's um Right. And I would, um, you know, it maybe sound odd coming from me as a professor and we're in a classroom. And, you know, there are things, the, the whole college experience, as you said, is very, I don't know, when I went back to get my PhD and I went back later in life, I'd taken a couple of classes and I remember chatting with one of the professors. He asked me how things were going. And I said, they're good. I'm getting, you know, good marks. And so, well, the classes are really just a small part. You should be working with professors. You should be going to conferences yeah, and working. Yeah, 100%, 100%. They present those conversations you have outside of the classroom, the bonds you make are, um, yeah. are so important. You know, I, I learned a lot of great stuff. I studied with some great people in my PhD program, but just the whole experience of being yeah. there. Also, I think that like success isn't linear, right? And so like, yeah, like right now, Jeep is doing well monetarily, but like that's not the only success I'm after. Like I want social success and educational success and all of these things. And so, um, School helps me achieve those. Yeah. Okay. We just have a few minutes left. And uh, Samantha, you had kind of a, a different question, but I think it's like a question that a lot of us are curious about. Uh, do you remember what that was about, you know, talk show hosts and things like that? Or 
Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Sam. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, so I was just wondering, as someone who's done like a lot of interviews um, yeah. with new casters on shows that like, I personally am always wondering like, oh, I wonder if that person is as polite off camera as they are on camera. So I just wanted to know what your experience with that was and yeah. if it's varied or if it's been consistent either way. I mean, I think most people are like nice. Like I, I wouldn't say that I've ever had an interview with anyone that I've walked away and been like, they sucked. Like <laughs> I, I don't know. I wanted them all to be my friends, but like people are generally, I think nice. Um, but what I will say is one experience is that I went to, I, um, an alumnus of my school who's a Democrat, who was one of the token Democrats at Fox News, uh, gave me a tour of Fox News. Um, and like we had meetings there. And I met like, whatever her name is, like Judge, whatever her name is, Janine, Jen, um, whatever her name is. And like, uh, Piro, yeah, Janine Piro. Yeah, yeah. yeah, her and like Eric Trump. And like, I met like a bunch of people when I was there and it was a bizarre experience to say the least. Um, and like, I couldn't call them out because like I was there as a guest of someone who works with them. So anyways, but um, I would literally be talking to people before they went on camera and they'd be telling me what they believe as a person and then they'd get, they'd get on the camera and say something completely different. Um, in that like, it's a money making business, right? And like, they say what gets them the ratings. Um, and that was pretty like eye opening that like someone could be so like normal and chatty with me and like again i wear like i wasn't like i, I wasn't calling them out but i wear my politics on my sleeve and then they'd go uh and get on camera and say such different things and they just said to me was pretty interesting and then i think i think in general though people that you see on tv like um i'm friends with more like celebrities than i am newscasters just because there's more celebrities my age than there are newscasters my age i guess um um people are just as like normal and like weird as regular peers are ir irrespective of their fame or stature um just because you can act and like put on a pretty face on tv doesn't mean that like you're a less complicated nuanced person but i think um but i i i i, I definitely think a lot of the people who you see on tv are playing a character even if it it says that they're presenting as themselves Okay, well, great. Well, we're right at 11.15, so thank you for joining us. No, um, thank you guys for having me. If I can ever be helpful, you let me know, and hopefully this was helpful and or interesting to some of y'all. Yeah. yeah, no, we're having a real variety of speakers, so, I mean, you, you added a lot. And uh, I, as I said, my email would have been great any time, but it's especially helpful now when we're, as you said, in Zoom University. So Yeah, so it's, it's a wild time to be alive, and I hope y'all are staying safe and well. Okay, well, I thank echo you. those sentiments, everyone. So let's... Thanks, Ziad. Um, I'll be in touch with everyone, um, you know, through email. If anybody has questions, um, and again, we went through the steps of the media tracking thing fairly quickly. Um, when you sit down and do it, um, if you have questions, shoot me an email. It'd be great. Okay. Um, so everyone else, have a good day. Stay safe and stay in touch. Have a good weekend, Rich. Okay. Do. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.